the foundational scripture that we started in was in Matthew chapter 9 and in verses 35 through 38 where I'm a paraphrase. It, it's said that Jesus went about the, the cities and the villages. He was teaching in the synagogues. He was preaching the gospel and he was healing sicknesses and diseases. In verse 36, it says that Jesus, this is Matthew chapter 9, he, he saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion for them because the multitudes were weary and they were scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And that's when he told his disciples, he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out labor, laborers into his harvest. And, and the, the, the challenge in this is uh, week number one, it's a really kind of a three-point series. It's I, 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 I dare you to care. Uh, there's a dare to care once again. Um, I, I, I dare you to share. Then today, I, I dare you to be rare. And we're going to get to that. Uh, the dare to care. It, it, the, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. The laborers are few. I've been moved my whole ministry with the story of David uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 17 when he went out under authority of his father to deliver the, the supplies to check on his brothers, but there, God had a purpose behind that, that, that little trip. That it, it had nothing to do with Jesse sending him. It, it, it had everything to do with uh, the, the, there was a, an army that was stood against Israel specifically one that was defying the armies of Israel, and Israel had lost their identity. Saul, who was a mighty man himself, had forgotten who he was supposed to be, and Israel forgot that they were in covenant with God, and they were allowing the intimidation of the enemy to, to push them into corners and behind trees and rocks, hiding from the intimidation from the enemy, and it took a shepherd boy who understood covenant. What's fascinating is David was not a perfect man. David had many faults in his life, but David wasn't connected to the situation and the circumstances where his mind was twisted and perverted the way the others were. David come out of the fields where he was still relying and trusting on God to take care of the very few sheep that he had in his care. It still took God's hand to move in that situation. You don't have to wait for God to give you something big before you start trusting God to give you what you need. David was trusting God when he had little, and therefore I believe that God was able to entrust him when he had great responsibility, knowing along the way there was many times of stumbling and repentance in his life. Can I get an amen? And yet he shows up on this battlefield and he recognizes immediately what's going on. He sees an uncircumcised Philistine defying the circumcised army of God. We know the story. We know it well. He finds himself standing opposed to this giant, this, this wrecking machine. And it took one rock thrown under the power of the Holy Spirit to bring that whole situation to a stop. But to lead up to that, David, while debating with his brother, when his brother was scolding him for even looking into the battle, David said, what have I done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a, is there not a reason? Is there not a, is there not a battle in front of us? Is there not a purpose to get involved? There's a reason why we need to stand up. There's a cause. I, I submit to you today that the cause is still before you and I today. The, the enemy of the body of Christ is still at work intimidating and lying and leading people astray. And many, too many Christians, as you're going to see where I'm going with this in a minute, not just the world, but too many Christians have given way too much over into bondage and sin is wrecking people's lives. Is there not a cause? I submit, I dare you to begin to care one more time. I showed you Week number one, we spent the bulk of our time, I was bringing up slide after slide, uh, showing you statistics that have been tracked over the last hundred years of where the church in this nation alone a hundred years ago used to be and where the church is now. And we keep hearing, oh, we're a generation or two away from extinction. No, we're a half a generation away from extinction about being the church that we're supposed to be because Church is not valued in society's eyes any longer. 
Church is belittled. The gathering in the corporate assembly is something that's been under attack for a long time. We need to fight harder to get people to come back to church. There's a cause. I dare you to begin to care one more time about what we're leaving behind us. Just because we believe Jesus is going to return soon is no excuse for you and I to lay down our battle and stop fighting because we just want Jesus to get us out of here. That's why I no longer am just promoting the idea that we need to just cock rapture, rapture, rapture. Why? Because the idea of rapture means we just want out of here. I'm sorry, there may be people that wouldn't make a rapture that we need to make sure we have something in place for the world to be ready to go through what they may go through. They asked Martin Luther one time, what would you do if you knew Jesus was coming back at noon tomorrow? He said, I would plant a tree today. There, is there not a cause? There's a, there's, a, there's a reason why we should care one more time about the church that you and I belong to. Can I get an amen? This is good preaching. Number two, not just I dare you to care, but what are we going to do about it? I dare you to share. I showed you that when John the Baptist uh, saw that God had called him to preach that the kingdom of heaven was near, and then he pointed to Jesus and said, Here, behold, the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And then as Jesus' ministry was moving forward, John was arrested and put in prison. And we know that he never left that prison. We know that they took his head. But it was a moment when John sent his two disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one or should we be looking for somebody else? The whole idea in this is Jesus made a statement and said from the moment of John the Baptist until now, he said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violence shall take it by force. And I showed you that in Matthew and, and in Mark and in Luke, that when it says the violence shall take it by force, that is, that is not the violence that is being perpetuated against the church. There is violence against the church, and God has been preparing us for a while to, to, to learn to, to work through, to endure, to persevere through persecution uh, because I believe persecution is on the brink of happening to the body of Christ in this nation. We, we've struggled with, you know, l l lesser things. We, we get mad at discrimination. We're not prepared for persecution. But persecution is part of what we should be prepared for because they hated Jesus. They're going to hate us. And, and so, therefore, we, we need to understand the church is going to be persecuted. But in that context, that's not what it meant. It meant the, the, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence. That word, the, the word suffered violence means people were pressing in. They were pressing in. Why? Because there, they were, there were those that were preaching the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And people were so sick and tired of the way the world was. They wanted what they were being told. They were pressing in. People are people. I think if we could get back to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and yet again stop trying to promote it, to, you know, put our, our stuff to it, stop trying to add to it, stop trying to, to, to bring the gospel inside a three-ring circus so that we can uh, lure people. If we would just preach the uncompromised gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm convinced that we will see people pressing into that one more time. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so uh, we, need to, we need to dare to care. We need to dare to share. If you think that it's my job to promote, preach, and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ alone, you're missing something along the way. It's our job. It's our job. As a matter of fact, my job, I don't know why this just died. It's got new batteries in it. Uh, it's my job to prepare the saints for the work of ministry. Amen. So that we can all, I'm going to have to go to this mic real quick. in the microphone, but he's just trying to stop this message, and he's not. Amen. And so we need, to, we need to dare to care. We need to dare to share, and sharing is something that we can all do. As we grow, we can be telling people about Jesus in our lives one more time. I know many, many do it, but it's a challenge that we take it to another level. Today, I want to bring this series to a close with this challenge to you. Now, mind you, week number one, week number two, I gave four side challenges that are still there. I challenged you to change your perspective 
uh, 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 on ministry by first just changing your perspective in church. We change our perspective in church when we're willing to find a different seat to sit in because what we do, not that there's a problem with where we're sitting, but we tend to take ownership of that which we sit upon. Can I get an amen? And, and, and here's the problem. We get comfortable, and we start seeing things from just our perspective. If we can learn to change perspectives and see things from a different perspective, maybe we'll see things in a new light. Maybe God will open a door for us to minister in a way that we never thought of, and it could could happen by just changing our perspective. Can I get an amen? Wow, that was super lame. <laughs> that tells me nobody wanted to change their seats. Okay, point taken. <laughs> You're comfy. May the Lord make that seat hot. Number two, side tempta- or side uh, challenges. Uh, overcome the temptation to just sit on the sidelines. This is huge because we, we, we all we have the tendency to just let the battle wage around us because we don't really want to get involved. I, I, it may cost me something. I don't have the energy. I don't have the time. Uh, n- no, don't don't succumb to that temptation. You're you're supposed to be in this fight too. Can I get an amen? As a as a pastor, as as a ministry leader, there are days when just the slightest little word from somebody in the church, just a little movement from somebody, can help build our faith and reassure us that we're not in this battle alone. Amen. It's it takes all of us. I'm I'm convinced Ephesians chapter four verse sixteen is one of the most forgotten, overlooked, misunderstood scriptures in the body of Christ. But it means literally. Every part doing its share. Every member doing its part. We are all in this together. Can I get an amen? Uh, Overcome. I dare you to overcome the temptation to not get involved. Uh, Number three on the side dares or the side challenges is I dare you to wake up out of the slumber that we're in. Because we've been, we've been rocked to sleep uh, as the body of Christ, and we need to wake up. And then, of course, number four is, I dare you. This is a dangerous prayer, but pray, pray, pray that the Lord of harvest would send workers one more time. Why do I, why do I say pray that? Because I'm convinced that if we would pray that God would send the workers for the harvest, we're going to find out that he's sending us. Amen. Oh, it's easy to pray for somebody else. Lord, I pray that you give them every opportunity they have. No, no, you pray that God will send the workers because you're going to find out he's going to open doors for you too. Amen. Amen. Today, I, I, I want to bring this to a close in just a few minutes that we have together with my final challenge. I, I dare you to be rare. To be rare. Let us look. Who's glad you came to church? What does Abel and Enoch, Noah, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Rahab and Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth and David and Samuel and the prophets, what do they all have in common? Can anybody tell me? What? They were all called by God. That's That's a good one. Say that again. They're all Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, they're found in the Old Testament. Those are those are pretty good. Well, they're they're mentioned in the New Testament in that order. They're mentioned. Yeah, they're they're mentioned in the New Testament in that order in the book of Hebrews. If we can quickly look at Hebrews chapter eleven, I want to show you something. They, they had all those things that you mentioned in common, but they they had something else in common also. Hebrews chapter eleven, verse thirteen. These all died in faith. That's a good message for today. I was really encouraged today. They all died in faith. They all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them. I I added the word they were because hermeneutics says that we're talking about them. So they, they, having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, the, the promises of God, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. 
what, what did they have in common? Yeah, everything that we just mentioned and this also. They were rare. They were different. They weren't common. There was something special about them. Can I get an amen this, this morning? I believe that the church has always been called, but there's a renewal to the call that the church should be rare. The word ecclesia found 118 times in the New King James Version Bible of the New Testament. 118 times this word is used. It's translated church. But here's what ecclesia means. It's not confusing if you understand the, the root behind it. It means called out and called into. Called out of and called into. That's what the church really means. When you hear the word ecclesia, it means called out of and called into. It, it, it's, it's not an oxymoron. It's not a confusing statement. It, it's a twofold purpose. The church was called out of their homes of commonality into a gathering of corporate assembly for Jesus Christ. The church has always supposed to have been called out to be called into. But yet, in the last 100 years in this nation alone, we've seen a progressive movement push to belittle the importance and the value of gathering together in the church. Now, I'm not one that's going to tell you that COVID wasn't real. COVID was very real, and COVID killed a million people in this nation alone. COVID was real. But COVID was a propaganda from the enemy of the church. The enemy of the church was using COVID to further separate us from corporate assembly. In four years, people left the church because they had to, to isolate. Many of them never returned. In their time away from corporate assembly, they've gotten more used to the idea that they can be comfortable in their home dialing in to social media alone. And social media is a wonderful tool. If you're sick and can't make it to church, thank God for social media. But it should have never been the replacement of your activity in the body of Christ. Amen. I still value the church. Why? Because the church should still be set apart and look different from the world. The, the, the church has a value that we need to get back to. The church, can I get an amen? And I believe that's one thing that God is stirring among the body of Christ again is the importance of corporate assembly. Why? Because in corporate assembly, this is where we're equipped. Now, the times that I've had to go see a physician of sorts. Last year when I had to have my, uh, my third hernia operation, I, 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 I needed to go to a doctor. I needed to, and the, the Lord, I didn't have to leave Fairfield, by the way. He, he actually brought a fantastic doctor into our lives. Um, <clears throat> but the truth is, is I didn't just go pick out anybody. Any, anybody stick your nose in a medical book? Because I could use a few words of encouragement in this. Uh, did anybody know somebody that read about? Has anybody seen a movie about doctors? That'll be good enough for me. Just I just need to go see somebody that can help my son. No, no, are you kidding me? I didn't want somebody who just saw a movie or, or read a book. I needed a physician that not only had been to school and been, been qualified and, and educated, I needed a physician that lives in continued education so that when I trust my body to them, they go in there, they're, they're equipped and trained and qualified to do what they need to do. Can I get an amen? Anybody get on an airplane? How many of y'all glad the pilots have great training? Because you're trusting your life into their hands. You're not going to get on an airplane with somebody who watched a movie or two. Oh, I, I flew an airplane on a simulator on a video game. I'm qualified. No, none of us would do that. If the pilot walked in and said, man, this is my first day on the job. I took three hours of training. Let's go. I'm off that plane. Come on now. If the doctor wants, like, I don't remember the name of that commercial, but one of my favorite commercials, I forget what they're even advertising, but the doctor walks in and says, look who's been reinstated. Well, sort of. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I need to know that you're qualified and equipped. Can I get an amen? We're all in agreement here, right? We're on the same page? Are we on the same page here? How come we're willing to be that diligent when it comes to those important issues, but We'll just lay down when it comes to the church. Are you kidding me? We need church to stay equipped. 
there's a, this isn't just what well, you just got to do your church thing. No, no. We need corporate assembly to continue being equipped because we're handling something that's more important than a body. We're, we're, we're handling something that has more value than an airplane. Amen. We're handling the most precious substance the world will ever see. And yet we need to be equipped. I value the church. The church needs to be special once again. Can I get an amen? It needs to be special once again. The church needs to be different once again. I I know I've shared a time or two in the past that I have... I have a wonderful, had a wonderful childhood growing up. I have many great memories. We, we were raised in a small town in the 70s and, and early 80s in a small town up in Wyoming. And, and it, there was this huge emphasis in, in the school district there that they, they had two or three functions that would happen every year that all the kids in the community, I mean, that's what marked our year. One of them was Relay Day. I mean, we're, the whole day was dedicated to, we, we would run races, we would do obstacles. I mean, we just looked forward to this. We would train in our little gym classes for weeks and weeks leading up to this day because this day didn't just give us a day out of the classroom. It, 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 this day gave us the bragging rights for the following year. If you, if you won certain races, you were, I mean, come on, I'm not talking to anybody today. It was field day, but it was a huge deal. And I was one of the, the faster kids in school. One thing I always had for me, going for me, was, was good speed. Now, I wasn't the fastest, but I was, I was always in the running, and so therefore there was always this emphasis of, man, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. On all the events, most of the time I got handed a nice little pretty green ribbon that said, Participant. Anybody ever received those before? Now, this is before the, the generation where we gave everybody a participant just for showing up. You didn't even show up, but you get a participant because we were thinking about you. You know what? You know, I'm just going to be honest. You, wanna, you know what participant means? You're just average. Come on now. A participant means you're, you're just mediocre. There's nothing special about what you did. That You just participated in that. I'm I'm sorry. I, I no that never the participant badge never made me feel good about anything, because when it came to these events, I didn't want to be average. I didn't want to be mediocre. I wanted to be special. Can I get an amen? We we, we have this epidemic of being okay with just average, just average, and we bring that into the church. Now, we're Renee and I are, are excited, and I, I want you to know. In just a couple of weeks, we're going to be taking four days off. It'll, it'll happen over a weekend, so I'll have somebody stand in and preach for us. But we, we, we're going to take some much-needed time off. Is that okay with you guys? I mean, we just need a break, and, and it's time for a vacation. And so we're, we're putting all of our money together, and we're, we're going to spend four days in Mejia. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> we're 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 gonna stay at Best Western Limestone. <laughs> we got <laughs> we got four days of uh, on our itinerary of the venues. We're gonna check out the Civic Center over there. I we're we're gonna go to the Rodeo Arena. I can't wait. We're hitting Walmart uh, one of those days. We're, we're eating at Frankie's one night. We're eating at Farmhouse the other night. We, we may go to Joe Friday's, uh, but we are, I just, I just can't wait. <laughs> Said nobody. Because not that there's a problem with Mahaya, but Mahaya is just like Tig and just like, just like Fairfield and just like scores and scores and scores of other towns just like it. Why? Because it's just normal. It's just, it's just average. Nobody saves up to go on a vacation to Mahia. But we'll absolutely save and go to Galveston. We'll go to London. We'll go to Paris. We'll go to somewhere where there's something exciting because those cities, those places, offer something that's beyond the average. Come on now. It, it, it's just normal. I don't want no normal. I'm tired of just normal. I, I want to break out of mediocrity. I want to, I want to be something rare. 
Amen. This, this is what the church needs to do. We, we need to stop just settling. Well, it's just a church. It's just mediocre. We'll just, no, 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 no. The church needs to be radiant one more time. The church needs to be magnificent one more time. The church needs to be rare one more time. The church, the church of Jesus Christ that God intended for it to be not average. Amen. Mediocre. Why do you think people don't want to come to church anymore? It's just, it's just there's nothing special happening. It's just church. Am I talking to anybody today? It's time to break out of the mediocrity. It's time to get out of just the average. It's time to be what God has called the church to be one more time so that we can be radiant. That was the idea that the body of Christ is supposed to be radiant and, and special and different. It's time for us to do those things. Now, I understand what got us here. I understand fully that over the last couple of generations within the body of Christ, that we started buying into a mindset that opened the door for mediocrity. We didn't realize it. We didn't, we didn't understand it. But in effort for the churches, specifically for the ministries, to be more relevant or more accepted by society, we opened the door for society to teach us what we need to look like, what we need to act like, how we need to behave. We became commercialized in many, many areas in the church. Yeah, I know that I've redefined what I am as far as one that believes in the gifts of the Spirit. I'm a continuationist. I believe in all of the gifts of the Spirit today. All of them. I have to keep restating this. I don't want anybody to believe that I don't believe in all the gifts of the Spirit for today, for right now. You know why we don't see the gifts of the Spirit in the church like we should? Because the church became commercialized. The church said, well, we'll take this, this, and this, but we can't give God room to do that because the video cameras are on and we don't want that being seen on TV. Are you guys listening to me today? Well, we, we need to be in control of this thing. Therefore, we, we can't have God moving in the service in a healthy, mannerly order that God will do because we need to control the outcome. I mean, I'm not picking on the, the ministries. You just do your own research when it comes to a lot of the popular ministries that are on, uh, on the, the world's front focus today. You just, just do a little research and you'll realize they all have quality control programs in place where the video cameras will only show the pastor's family in certain views and certain angles because there's an image they're trying to build and protect because they can't afford for people to see what God may be doing through the body of Christ. We become commercialized. There's 60-year-old pastors that are dressing like they're 19 because they want to be relevant. Okay, is there wrong, something wrong with the way they dress? No, but if they're dressing that way, they're probably acting that way. They're compromising. They're not being who God has called them to be because they're trying to be the image that the world has told them, you need to be like this, and I'll come to your church. What have we become? Common. Average. We're just normal. We just look like society. There, there are many churches that you can't tell the difference between the church and society by what's going on in the church because they're not preaching holiness. They're not preaching purity. They're not preaching against sin. They're preaching all the fluff stuff. There are people that will not come be a part of this church because they're going to another church because in the other church, they're not going to be warned or cautioned about what's going on in their life. Now, we're not here to judge and condemn people, but we do need to be in people's lives to warn them about what's going on. There's a very real enemy, and he's out to destroy the church, and we need to wake up, and the church still needs to look different from the world. We can love the world. We can embrace we can go out and be a part of the world to get the gospel out, but we cannot compromise who we are. God did not bring us out of that to send us back in to look just like it. But there's too many today that claim they are for Jesus Christ, but they're not following Jesus Christ. They're following the world. And they're going to sit in a church where they're not held accountable to what they say they are. I'm an orange. No, you're demonstrating fruit of an apple. Now, just tell me you're an apple, and we're okay. We can start working for that point forward, but don't tell me you're an orange when all I see is apple. And then get mad at me because I'm saying, but you said you're an orange. I see an apple. Which one's wrong? You're judging me. Yeah, I am. I'm judging what you said because you said it, not me, you. 
But the, but the church isn't willing to do that today because we're afraid. Why? What are we afraid of? We're afraid of not being liked. Come on, church. God didn't call us to make sure you do everything to be liked by everybody. He said the opposite. They're going to hate you. They're going to hate you. They hated me. They're going to hate you. <sighs> Am I talking to anybody today? This just isn't very uplifting today, is it, Pastor? No, I'm sorry. But we're being prepared for battle. Amen. The, 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 the church, we got ourselves here because we, we lowered our standard. And then when we lowered our standard, we, we, we lessened the message that follows that standard. The reason there was a standard to begin with is because there was a message we believed. A message that said, stop doing this and start doing that. Stop living like this and start living like that. That standard was here. We lowered that standard to get other people in. And instead of them coming in and changing, they came in and we changed. And we've got to get back to the church that Jesus has called us to be. Amen. Amen. Now, Aaron, if you would, I know I mention this scripture often. Maybe because I, I'm, I'm continuing to get revelation on this scripture, but there's something about this verse that I can't, we can't get away from. There's something about this verse that to me is a glaring indictment of, uh, against the church of what we're not doing, something that we're supposed to be doing. Are y'all with me so far? Aaron, if you'll bring up Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. This is an important verse. This, this, this verse really should set on fire those that want to see the church function in all the gifts of the Spirit, those that want to see the church become effective in the community. If you will, just let's just set this up for a minute. Back up to verse 8, and we're going to come back to verse 10, okay? Are y'all with me this morning? Paul wrote, to me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Now look, to the intent, back up to verse 9 one more time. To make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, the koinonia of the ministry, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. This has always been God's plan. Are y'all with me? Who created all things through Jesus Christ. Now look at 10 one more time. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made, might be made known by by. The church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Can I just tell you what that's saying? That all of hell will pay attention when the church acts the way the church is supposed to act. Because the manifold wisdom of God, the multivaried understanding of his wisdom, that the manifold wisdom of God means there's not just one stream. That you pick a topic, there's wisdom from God that is going to cover that topic. God will give us wisdom in everything. The manifold wisdom of God shall be made known to the principalities and the powers by the church. What does that tell you? There should be power in the church. There should be authority in the church. There should be, there should be great discernment and wisdom in the church. There should be demonstration in the church. There's a scripture in Corinthians where Paul says, I didn't come to you with words of great wisdom, but I came to you in demonstration and power. Now, that scripture meant one thing to me until I had this wonderful revelation one day, and I shared it with my pastor, and he had me preach on it. Back in uh, 2008, 2009, I, I, I wrecked my truck and, you know, bought a Mustang. Amen. Use that opportunity to put myself in an almost brand new Mustang. And it was the Mustang with the GT motor, the motor in it. I mean, it was fast. It was bad. 
And I was driving down the road one day, and I, I started noticing this, this body style of Mustang, the, the 2005s through the 2012s. And I started noticing something, that some Mustangs written on the bottom of the rocker, they had to spell out the word Mustang. Mine didn't have that. Mine didn't have Mustang written on it. It had a little badge on the, the very back. But mine didn't have the, the stickers that said Mustang. And, and the more I started paying attention, I started seeing a, a difference in them. Every Mustang that had a V6 in it, which should be a crime all in of itself. You didn't put a V6 in a Mustang. Put a V8 in that Mustang. But every Mustang that had a V6 in it had that sticker along the side of it. Every V8 produced did not. Why? It had to tell you it was a Mustang. Because it surely couldn't show you. Come on now. Yeah, the, the, the church is here that we should be demonstrating the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and the powers through the church. It's time for us to become rare one more time. Am, am I helping anybody? It's time for us to become rare. Now, I want to share another scripture with you. We truly should be different. Bring up Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. I love this because being rare means there should be certain things that are manifest through the church, not just what we see, the wisdom of God, but the character of men. I, bring up Isaiah 40, verse 31. When you, when, you, when you do Bible study, when you research the Word and you go after the Hebrew and the Greek and you realize that it, almost every time it doesn't take away from what our translations say, it actually adds to what our translations teach. Now, we know this Scripture. We pray this Scripture. We love this Scripture. We quote this Scripture. We put this Scripture on our refrigerators, on our mirrors. We share this with people because there's a great understanding of this Scripture those that wait on the Lord shall, come on now, I'm not, I'm not going to mock it. I'm not, I'm not going to pick on it. Let's say it. Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Yeah, I love this. I love this. It, but when you understand this in the Hebrew, I love it even more. This isn't just a scripture of victory. This is also a scripture of encouragement to persevere to endure, to fight, to stay in this thing, to be consistent. Don't quit. What do you mean, pastor? Well, that word wait isn't the, the word wait that we would think it is. Well, you know, if you just trust in God and just sit still and wait on him, he'll show up one day. And when he shows up, his strength will come and will be renewed. Come on, that's how, that's how it's promoted. Just wait on God. Yeah, that's not what that word means. In the Hebrew, that word means gather. Stop just waiting on God. Gather together. Where two or three are gathered together, there he is. Come on now. We're like a threefold cord when we come together. When we come together, we are better. We're stronger. Come on. Those that come together in the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. Then they will run and not be weary. That's not just a victory statement. That's an endurance statement. Who can run and not become weary? I will race everybody in this church and beat everyone in the first 10 steps. And then I'm tired. And I got to have a seat. I surely can't run a marathon because I'm not built for endurance physically. Can I get an amen? They will walk and not faint. That, this, is, this is character. This, what this is? Rare. Rare. To, to be able to endure, to go, to not just fight for a couple minutes and give up and go do something else, but once you get into the fight, you're in this fight for the long haul. You persevere to, to endure, to fight the fight, to stay in it, to be consistent. It takes character. It takes becoming out of the norm, out of mediocrity, and stepping into an environment of being very rare. 
Somebody that when you get into this, you know you're in it and you're not going to quit. The only way I'm out of this is Jesus comes back and gets me out of this or calls me home. Can I get an amen? We need to be rare. This, this is not just a victory. Is, am I helping anybody today? It, I'm telling you, when you read the Bible, the Bible is so much fun. Can I get an amen? And so, and so, so, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. I just have 30 more minutes. Um, listen, being rare begins in the heart of each one of us. Now, in Numbers, we don't, we're going to go to Numbers chapter 14 real quick. Aaron, if you'll go to Numbers chapter 14, verse 20. But in Numbers chapter 13, we see the, the moment when God, through Moses, calls 12 men to go off into the land that he had promised Abraham to spy out the land. We, we know it. It was mentioned again uh, last Sunday. Uh, and, and we know that the 12 went into the land. The 12 came back. Uh, two of the 12 had a good report. Ten of them said, this, this is beyond us. We, we're not able to accomplish this. Their testimony before the assembly in Numbers 13 was, we're, we're like grasshoppers in those giants' eyes. And so, therefore, we're, we're grasshoppers. It, well, no, he, I'm sorry. He said, we're grasshoppers in our own eyes. So, we're like grasshoppers in their, their eyes. How they saw themselves is how the enemy saw them. And so they disqualified themselves by the way they thought in their own heart, their own mind about who they were. We can't, we can't, we can't. Two of the 12 came back and said, no, it's exactly what it's supposed to be, and we can go do this and do this right now. God is on our side. Let's go do this. Well, it didn't happen. We get into Numbers chapter 14, and the assembly is pulled back together and God begins to speak. And, and there's this, an exchange between God and Moses that I don't have time to get into today. But Moses speaks a truth to God about, listen, you could just kill these rebellious people like they're one man and you can just wipe away the whole thing. But you don't want to do that because your name is behind this and the other uh, uh, nations are, are paying attention to this. Show yourself mighty in this. And so let's get to verse 20. I, you, you need to hear what God is saying. Am I talking to anybody today? Those two of the 12 was Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. This is, he, he, it, it's, I'm not saying that Moses changed God's mind. I'm saying that the way he's wording this, God is saying, you spoke a correct word right there, okay? Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Keep going. But truly, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. This is God speaking on behalf of his people. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put and have put me to the test now these ten times. You know, God, God is a God of wrath. There's no doubt about it. But you can't separate God's wrath from His mercy. He's always been a God of mercy. But when His wrath comes, please don't ever, don't let anybody ever lie to you and try to convince you that God is unjust, that God's not fair. In every situation, God has always given opportunity for mercy. And if you don't take it, that is on you and not him. This is a merciful God all these ten times. This, he's been patient. He's been tolerant. But his word is his word. Amen. These signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. Okay, look at the next verse. They certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their father, fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Look at the next one. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit. But Caleb's rare. Caleb's not just normal. There wasn't anything mediocre in Caleb. Caleb didn't come back and say, you know, I waited it out. Maybe the, the other ten are right. Maybe we can do it, but maybe just not right now. No, he came back of one or two and said, we've got this. Yeah, but there's giants. I know it's exactly what God said it was, but we got it. 
We can do it. We can do it right now. Yeah, why? He was rare. He, 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 he got pat. There was no mediocrity in him. He, he was rare. He was something special in his heart. Are y'all hearing me today? My servant, Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully. I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. When we set ourselves apart in our own heart to serve God, to worship God, to be consecrated by his word, by the presence of the Holy Spirit, we set ourselves into a category where we are supposed to be rare compared to the rest of the world. I submit that we get back to that. You know, I, the percentages on this, two of the 12, I believe that's like 16.6% of the 12 came back and said, we can do this. Did you know the 84% came back and all they could speak about was the objections? But the two others came back and all they could speak about was the objective. There's a difference. When we put ourselves in service to God and we start seeing ourselves the way God sees us and, 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 and we commit to God, we can stop looking at what we can't accomplish. Maybe we can get back to is there not a cause. The objective is there's a world that's dying and going to hell. The, uh, the immediate objective is the church needs to wake back up. Amen. The answer in this objective is we begin to share the gospel. So I dare you to care. I dare you to share. And I dare you once again to become rare before God. Amen. Can I pray for you? Some of you are like, I just dare you to hurry up and finish. I'm hungry. <laughs> Father, it's in the name of your son that I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. Father, I thank you that you are still at work, but you are challenging us in so many different areas to become radiant one more time. Not that we're building our ministries, Father. There, there's, there's, there's enough ministries. But, Father, that we are becoming useful to you in the communities that we live in, in the jobs we work, in the circles we're in, that you are calling us to be separated from the world while we live in the world, Father, but we are still supposed to be strangers, foreigners. Now, Father, I'm asking that these, these words spoken over the last few weeks aren't just words that will be closed up on some notes and shoved into a book in a corner on a, on a shelf somewhere, but these are notes that we will work with, we will meditate on, we will ponder, we will let the Scripture get into us. The revelation will become ours. The fire will start, Father. We, we will begin to see that you are calling each one of us to continue doing something powerful for you, Father. And I pray more. Father, I'm not asking for bigger barns full of stuff. I'm not asking for more money in the bank account. I don't need more notoriety. notoriety. Father, I'm asking for more opportunity to be used by you. Help me to win my whole family to Jesus. Help me to win my neighbors to Jesus. Help me to win those that I'm in circles with on a daily basis. Help me to be a blessing to them. Father, part of being rare is learning the value of giving. Help us to understand it's not what we, what, we, what we get or receive. It's truly what we give of ourselves. I would hope, Father, that these simple words would become motivation for all of us. You're calling us to be special one more time. You're calling us to be rare one more time. Help us to move out of the mediocrity, the norm, the casual, the common. Help us to be special for you. I pray this humbly but boldly in the name of Jesus, Father, and I ask that you would go with us, go before us, prepare a path. Bring us back Wednesday evening with a spirit of expectation. It's in the name of Jesus I pray, and the church said amen. I love each and every one of you. God bless you. Have a great day.